Mr. Lowe. Could you just have a couple of minutes for me, please? No, I'm sorry. We believe you had quite an entrance into the Morgan Stanley event, sir. Um, the music that was played, do you think it was appropriate that it be played? No, I'm sorry, I don't have any more comments. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch and to the latest round of Get Phil, the man the media loves to hate, with the current affair charging Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe with a callous musical crime. Taking the stage to a feel-good number. <laughs> Justin Timberlake's hit single, Can't Stop the Fear. Stop the so a low blow for the 3.3 million Australian households paying off mortgages. A low blow, all right, with crime editor Simon Boder chasing the RBA boss down Sydney's George Street and asking him... I mean, it was unusual, can't stop the feeling. I mean, the feeling that most of the mortgage holders have got today wouldn't be good. It was cringeworthy stuff, especially given this concession. I mean, I know you didn't choose the music, sir, but... Wouldn't that give you some reason to give us a comment about the appropriateness of it? How would you feel as a journalist asking that question? But if you work for a current affair, that's the sort of crap you have to get used to. With reporter Steve Marshall dispatched to South West Sydney to get the public's verdict on the RBA governor's supposed musical atrocity. Yeah, that's a nice song, but not for putting up mortgages. To that song, up on, up on the no, stage, you skipped... That's not appropriate. No. no. From the supermarket aisles to the dry cleaners, Steve Marshall made the shocking discovery that there was no sunshine in the latest mortgage rate hike. What will it be today, Steve? Hey, can you give my mortgage a trim? Trim? Easy. And after five minutes of that, it was time for some serious analysis with Alison Langdon quizzing a struggling cafe owner about her reaction. So to see the governor walk on stage today in front of a room full of suits and ties in the city to a happy, cheery song, just one day after he raised rates again, what did you think? The response? That Lowe was being unprofessional. It was pathetic stuff. And just to be clear, all based on this. <laughs> yes, about ten seconds of music, which Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe had nothing to do with. And, of course, ACA had no time for anything of substance from Lowe's speech in which he tried to explain why rates are going up again. Obviously, that's of no interest to ACA's viewers, or, more likely, its reporters and producers. But now to the release of a monster. At least that's what the media called baby killer Kathleen Folbig 20 years ago on her convictions for murder and manslaughter. Convictions that may now be quashed after triumphant headlines like this. Mother of all pardons. Justice! I'm free. Kathleen Folbig released after wrongfully serving 20 years jail for her four children's deaths. Folbig's pardon has been a massive media story right around the world, with huge sums of money being offered for exclusive access. So, it was a big surprise when shortly after the New South Wales Attorney General announced her unconditional pardon, it was Nine's TV cameras on hand in northern New South Wales to record Folbig's first moments of freedom. A 20-year journey ending in the arms of her best friend and biggest supporter. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> my stinky shoes are your face. <laughs> How do you feel? I am so elated. It's not funny. I'm <laughs> nervous and I've everything. It was strange that Nine was there at all, and even stranger that It was claiming the scoop. Because, in a bidding war run by Ben Fordham's brother Nick, Seven had just paid a fortune for the TV exclusive. Seems Nine must have got a tip-off. But luckily for Seven, it scored some pictures too. And on the UK's Channel 4 News, which used footage from both broadcasters, Seven's exclusive couldn't be missed, because it was plastered over every frame. Even when Nine's cameraman came into shot. But, remarkably, it wasn't Seven who shot this reunion. It was Tracy Chapman's son, Presley, on a mobile phone. And seems it was Tracy herself who got Seven's exclusive footage from inside the house. We've got Kath here. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> and she's just turned up in the last few minutes. Seven will have a genuine exclusive on Spotlight in coming weeks for Kathleen's sit-down interview, for which the network reportedly paid more than $400,000, or perhaps as much as $1 million. So, how has this story played out in the media? Kathleen Folbig was famously jailed for 40 years back in 2003 for the murder of three of her infant children and the manslaughter of another, all of whom died before they were two. As Seven Sunrise reported at the time... 
Caleb was only 19 days old when he died in 1989. A failed attempt to suffocate Patrick left him blind and brain damaged. He was killed at eight months in 1991. Sarah was 10 months when she was murdered in 1993 and Laura, 19 months, killed in 1999. The evidence against Folbig was circumstantial, with no forensic evidence to show she killed them. But the front page headlines that hailed the verdict left no room for doubt. She killed them all. Dead by their mother's hand. Why I killed my four babies. Mum's diary reveals deadly confession. And in an editorial headed Seeds of Evil, the Daily Telegraph condemned the convicted baby killer for her crimes, suggesting they were... The result of latent wickedness, of an unspeakable evil that exists in the hearts, mercifully, of a depraved handful of humanity. There's no doubt the world reserves a special place in hell for women who kill their children. And writing to her foster sister from her prison cell, Folbig admitted she was the most hated woman alive. But in also pleading her innocence, she added prophetically... Vindication will one day be mine. And thanks to her supporters, some pioneering science and some champions in the media, she has now been freed. The first serious challenge to Folby's conviction came in 2011 in a book by law professor Emma Cunliffe, which included a chapter called Media Monster and claimed... The press reporting overwhelmingly represented Folby's guilt as certain. During her trial, that had seemed perfectly reasonable. Folby's husband testified against her and her diaries appeared to contain confessions to her crimes. But as time went on, not all in the media were sure of her guilt. In 2014, shock jock Alan Jones revealed he had visited Folby in prison and he believed her to be innocent. And he continued to question the evidence that had jailed her. There were four deaths not a mark on any of the children to demonstrate that they'd been abused by the mother. No scientific evidence that any of Kathleen Folbig's babies had been murdered. And as Jones and others in the media made clear, a key plank of the prosecution case, provided by British paediatrician Sir Roy Meadow, had been discredited. He was the one who coined the saying, one sudden infant death is a tragedy, two is suspicious, three is murder, unless there's proof to the contrary. This became known as Meadows' law. It was subsequently established that this man had given incorrect evidence outside his area of expertise. He has been barred from ever giving evidence again. In 2015, Folbig's legal team, led by barrister Robert Kavanagh, petitioned the New South Wales Attorney-General to review the case. And three years later, the ABC's Australian story showcased the doubts about her conviction. Australia's leading forensic pathologist has given an opinion. He is supported by other international experts. There are natural causes of death in this case. That program helped bring about the first judicial inquiry, which was announced nine days later. But it did not bring change. In 2019, in a 500-page judgment, former New South Wales DPP Reg Blanche re-examined the evidence and convicted Folbig all over again. What this inquiry has found is that it reinforces her guilt and there is no reasonable doubt that she is responsible for all four deaths. Folbig launched an appeal against the inquiry verdict, which also failed. But media pressure for Folbig's release did not abate. And in 2020 came a vital breakthrough, with Quentin McDermott reporting new scientific evidence that the two female Folbig children had a genetic mutation which could have killed them. And that new evidence brought powerful support from some of Australia's most eminent scientists. Who have signed a petition for the pardon and immediate release of convicted child killer Kathleen Folbig. That petition ultimately led to a second inquiry that has now set her free. Its full report has not yet been published, but former New South Wales Chief Justice Tom Bathurst has made it clear there are now reasonable doubts about Folbig's guilt. But as Folbig's pardon came through, not everyone was convinced. Least of all, Folbig's ex-husband Craig, whose lawyer Danny Ede was asked on Sunrise... Kathleen supporters say this decision proves her innocence. Why don't you believe the science that says she's a victim, not a murderer? Well, the science does not say that she's a victim. She has not been acquitted of those convictions. Craig has no doubt that his children uh, were murdered. Folby's convictions for murder and manslaughter have not yet been overturned. 
But that may be the next step, depending on what the inquiry recommends. And millions of dollars in compensation could then follow. Meanwhile, Folbig has released her own video statement to thank her many supporters for believing in her when the world did not. Today is a victory for science and especially truth. And for the last 20 years I have been in prison, I have forever and will always think of my children, grieve for my children and have missed them and love them terribly. Thank you. So, did the media fail by branding her guilty all those years ago? I don't believe they did. But after two decades in prison, they certainly have played a part in setting her free. But now to violence on the soccer pitch and a story that shocked viewers. A 25-year-old man has been arrested over the alleged assault of a veteran referee. Kodiaki had three teeth knocked out and his jaw broken in multiple places. Six weeks ago, that ugly punch-up at a suburban Sydney football ground was national news. And for good reason. One, two, three punches and then kicked in the head. His alleged attacker, Adam Abdullah. Seven, nine, ten and the ABC all ran graphic footage of the incident, with the ABC telling viewers... The behaviour has been condemned by Football New South Wales and the Premier, Chris Mims. And the chorus of condemnation continued in the papers next day, with the telly leading the charge, labelling the incident a riffing disgrace. While the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian also ran the story, but in more subdued tones. And that day, when alleged ref basher Adam Abdullah was refused bail, the TV networks all replayed footage of the incident from the night before. But outside court, 10 News reported that... Mr Abdullah's lawyer argued the clip was just a few seconds of what was a five minutes long incident. What else haven't we seen? It'll come out later on in court. Yes, the media was given a heads up there might be another side to the story. But that didn't stop Nine's reporter paying an exclusive visit to Coda's home and declaring he was... 25 years a referee, but forever a role model. While on Tens the project, Waleed Ali was thanking him for his public service. You know, your defiance and your courage and your determination is clear, Khadr. Thank you so much for speaking to us tonight. So, while Kota Yagi recovers from the assault, what has happened to his alleged attacker? Well, Adam Abdullah spent all of May on remand behind bars. But on May the 31st, he fronted the New South Wales Supreme Court to apply for bail. And Seven News reported... Shock new video has helped get a man out of jail after turning his court case on its head. This video put him in jail. But this one helped him get out. According to Seven, the new footage allegedly showed that the referee Koda Yagi had thrown the first punch at Adam Abdullah. And after viewing it, even the prosecution conceded it changed the story. But that wasn't the only twist. Abdullah isn't the only one facing charges. Kota Yagi is before the courts as well. He's been charged with assault occasioning actual bodily harm of a pub patron in March. It was a stunning development. And after the huge attention given to the case, it was one that all the media should surely have noted. So, how did they go? Well, most, like the telly, revealed how the new video changes the narrative. But we could find nothing about it in the Sydney Morning Herald or The Australian, or on The Project and ABC News. So why did they ignore the new footage? And why have they not told viewers that Cody Yagi is facing serious assault charges on an unrelated incident? It is a good question, and we are still not clear of the answer, despite asking them all. But the ABC, Sydney Morning Herald and The Australian say they will cover the story when it's back in court. Cody Yagi has pleaded not guilty to his charges. Adam Abdullah's lawyer says he will fight his charges too. Let's hope that all the media tell you the outcome. And finally, to Nine's bizarre choice of fill-in for Neil Breen, who is set to leave Brisbane's 4BC. From Monday, June 26, seasoned journalist Peter Gleeson will fill in on 4BC Drive. He's a good mate of mine. He's a passionate journalist. He's going to do a great job here on 4BC on Brisbane Live. A passionate journalist who'll do a great job. And that quote was seized on by Gleeson's old paper, The Courier Mail, which told readers... Gleeson, a former The Sunday Mail editor and Sky News presenter, left News Corp last November after more than 30 years with the company. So uh, why did he leave, or have you forgotten? What 4BC and The Courier Mail failed to mention was that Gleeson was banished from News Corp following multiple instances of plagiarism in his column such as lifting four whole paragraphs of analysis from a piece by former ABC journo Josh Bavis. 
and another 13 paragraphs from a 2015 story by ex Courier Mail journalist Jason Tin, all for a 12 page special taking aim at Queensland's Palaszczuk government. And there were many more examples. Gleeso even coughed up an apology after an investigation by the Mail, telling readers it was not a deliberate act and calling the error unintentional plagiarism. Right. But despite all that, Nine still decided the story stealer was worthy of being on air. And they're adamant that Gleeso has an understanding... ..of Nine's values, broadcasting expectations and standards. For his part, Peter Gleeson is excited to be reborn while admitting in a statement... I made a mistake at News Corp and I deeply regret what happened. I am very grateful for this opportunity at 4BC and I hope to prove I'm worthy of a second chance. Lucky man. Let's hope his radio show is less uh, repetitive than some of his newspaper columns. That's all from us for tonight. You can read statements from The Australian and the ABC on our website. And don't forget Media Bytes on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. But for now until next week, goodbye.